So when he says, and his form more than the sons of men. So the form of Christ, our Savior and our Lord, was beaten to the point, was beaten to the point that it was, it was mad more than the sons of men. There's nobody, there's nobody in history that has ever been beaten or has ever seen the, the kind of violence to the extent that Christ had it. And do you know why that is so, by the way? That is because he was experiencing the penalty of sin. He was experiencing the wrath of God. Yep. So it was not just... It was not just Let's pray. Our dear everlasting Father, we bless you this wonderful evening, Lord. You are the King of glory, the holy everlasting Father, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior, the darling of heaven, the beauty of eternity, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we worship you, our Redeemer. There's none like you, there'll be none like you in heaven and on earth. You are great, you are magnificent, Lord. You are magnified in the heavens above, my Father, Lord, your name is declared among the people. And Lord, you save, you seek, and you save, O Lord, that which is lost. We bless you, our Savior, today, even as we dive into your word. Lord, may you give us, uh, may you give us, Lord, understanding, the understanding of the Spirit, the understanding of our hearts, my Father, Lord. May you open our, our ears and, and, and our eyes of understanding, my Father, Lord, our spiritual antennas, my Father, that you may be able to get your word the way you intended it to. To, to get to us, my Lord. We bless you for your everlasting word. We bless you, my Father, Lord, the word that you've exalted above a, your own name. And we bless you for it, my Father. And we ask you, Lord, even as we start this Bible study, my Father, those who will join us later on, my God, we bless you and we ask you, Lord, that you may also, Lord, quicken their spirits, my Father, Lord, quicken their minds, my God, in the mighty name of Jesus. As we, div as we dive into your word, my God, may we get into the understanding of the spirit. May we get to see, Lord, the gravity of your word, the beauty of your word, the holiness of your word, my Father, because you are the word made flesh for our sex, my God. We bless you this wonderful evening, O Lord. May you be glorified for Forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen, O oh Lord. We worship you. We bless you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord, that we are here today, O oh Lord. May you help me, my Father, Lord, as the one transmitting your word, my Father, Lord, that I may trans transmit it, O oh Lord, perfectly the way you want it to be transmitted, O oh Lord. Help my voice, my Father, Lord. Touch my voice, my God. Touch me, O oh Lord, that I may be able to transmit your word perfectly and righteous, my Lord, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. We worship you. We bless you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, the word of God is, is a privilege for us to have because if the creator of the universe desired that men know him, how would he do it? If God was to reveal himself, to human beings, how will he do it? He will speak to them, right? Or he will show up. He will show up and speak to them. And probably you want to write it down <laughs> for future reference because he won't be coming to say the same, same thing over and over again, right? Uh, so God has, has revealed himself to us through his word. And this is what we have at this point. Amen. And this is the word of God. So, and we've been doing the book of uh, John, uh, what we call the prologue is what we did the the last two weeks, and we are still there. Uh, if we leave, we'll just leave a little bit, but we'll still come back there. But the book of John chapter 1 uh, to verse 1 to 18 is where we are going to look into today. And the reason why we're going to do that is because there's so much gem in those few verses that we'll do it a great disservice if we don't explore a lot of it. If we don't explore a lot of it. Because what has happened so far, and this is what I usually say to people who ask me why we we, we dive into the word of God so much and we want to read so much of it is because the generation that we're living in right now, be it in the church setup or outside the church setups, and by that I mean organizations that are Christian, but they are based on the word of God. What has happened in so many of these places, especially where the youths are involved, is that we have we have read the word of God devoid of the context. Mm. You've taken a few verses 
and we've based our whole theology on it. Yeah. And it's sad because the word of God is such a gem that you have to read it in context. And that is what we are going to do here. And so the 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 this first chapter of the book of John, which you're going to look into right now, verse 1 to 18, is, is the summary of the gospel. And I'm going to show you why I say that specifically, that it's a summary of the gospel. Now, last week we read, and I'd like us to read. Do you, do you, do you have a Bible? But here, here. Um, and I'd like us to read, uh, Andy, yeah. please. John chapter 1, verse 1. You can read verse 1 up to verse 5. John 1. Verse 1, I'm reading from NKGB. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and apart from Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. The light shined in darkness, and darkness hasn't overcome it or in other versions, has not only comprehended. Yes, yes. Yeah. The, there, uh, see, um, five. Well, you can continue now that you want to read it so <laughs> much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sweet. Yeah. Uh, verse six. Uh, there, there came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but was said that he might testify about the light. Mm. The truth, the true light that enlightens everyone has come into the world. He was in the world and the world has uh, was made through him, mm. but the world did not recognize him. He came to him, uh, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, mm. To them he gave the right to become God's children. Mm. To those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, mm. not uh, nor of the will of the flesh, mm -hmm. nor of the will of man, mm. but of God. Mm. And the word came, and the word became flesh yes. and lived among us. Mm. We saw the glory, yes. such glory as of the one of only of the Father, mm. full of grace and truth. John testified about him and shouted out, saying, This is the one of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, for mm. he was before me. For of, for, for of his fullness mm. we all received, mm. and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No, no one has seen God at may, uh, no one has seen Same God, God. Mm. at any time. Mm. The only Son, who is the uh, who who is at this Father's side, has made Him known. Amen. Amen. The pro that is what we call the prologue of John. And like we said last week, it's John telling us, "Hold on to your seat, guys. I'm about to take you on a ride." But this is the summary of the work of our Savior. And our Lord, when he came to earth to save us, this prologue, verse 1 to verse 18, is what we consider the, the summary of the whole gospel. And I'll tell you why I say that specifically. Uh, and it's given from a disciple's perspective, more specifically, a disciple that the Bible says that was very close to Jesus. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. And how he starts to put down the gospel is he summarizes the entire gospel. I mean, he summarizes the entire gospel. And that is important because in a place where some heretics had started springing up and they had not received the gospel firsthand from Jesus, but from different sources. So it's either there was there was doubt settling in about the gospel of Christ. And so John, during a later time of his, of his life, 
decides to pin this gospel so that he can address either the doubts that were settling in or to put to put out an account a personal account of his uh, of his experience with our savior lord jesus and the way he starts to write this gospel is by telling us where jesus comes from beyond his biology matthew does that mark does that look does that but he gives he gives us his he gives us his origin his origin from our from our perspective his origin where he comes from which is that he has been before time that's what it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so in the beginning when everything uh ev- when everything started he was so he did not start with everything else so he's not created so Jehovah's Witness, I'm sorry, but y'all are just heretics. There's nothing like Jesus was a created angel. Mm-hmm. It's nowhere in the Bible that even insinuates that Jesus was created. Jesus was not created. He has always been. And then he tells us that he was with God the Father. So he had fellowship with God the Father. And he was God in nature. In his nature, he is God. So there's no part of who God is that is not in Christ. And so there's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these are one. <laughs> we don't have three gods. We have one God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that is what we see here. But the beauty of this prologue is that John tells us the ministry of Christ. And I'd like us to read from verse one, uh, one to three says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was made, uh, without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of man. Now, if you go back to verse 15, if you go down to verse 15, if you leave it there and the life was the light of man, and you read verse 15 says, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. Now, John the Baptist proclaiming the Messiah before the Jews starts in a very interesting place. He starts where? John, this is John the Baptist. Now we're talking about in verse 15. He says, he says, he comes, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So verse one to three that talks about the origin, the origin story. For y'all who, who love comic books or listen, uh, which is Marvel movies, origin stories, you know origin stories. Where John starts, John the disciple. Where John starts is where John the Baptist also starts. Yeah, starts yeah. So you see the harmony of the of uh, uh, of the message of our Messiah and our Savior. In fact, the message of John the Baptist is the message of Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When he comes to preach repentance to Israel, which was, by the way, more like an insult to them, because the Jews knew they were the chosen people of God. They were the righteous people of God. So any single prophet or any single person that shows up and tells them that they need to repent and be, in fact be cleansed <laughs> was an insult. When Jesus shows up later on and has an issue with the, with the, with the Pharisees, yes. Abraham is our father. They were very proud people. We are righteous by default. Yeah. We are righteous as a people. There's, there's nothing that it won't be at CC where it we are nini it it who our father is our father our you know Abraham was our father the great man of faith you see you see and so where John the Baptist starts is the same same place where John actually starts and that is why it is very important for you to know the reason why the book is written the reason why this book is written which you saw in the book of John chapter uh, 
20 verse verse 30 verse 31 20 verse 31 it says but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God and that believing you may have life in his name so every single thing that is written in this book is so that you may believe that Jesus is the son of God and the son of God in this context is not just the son of God the way we think the son of in a Hebrew context when you tell when you tell the Israelites that this is the son of God what they hear is this is God and that is why the Bible says they took stones and wanted to stone him and down there it says we are not stoning you because of the signs or because of the works yes but you declaring you son of God you've made yourself equal with God so when John is closing the book and saying these are written but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Christ which we saw last time which is the title what he came to do the Christ is the Messiah the savior the son of God and that believing you may have life in his name you may have life in what in his name the book of philippians says that in the name of jesus every knee shall do what bow. shall bow and every tongue shall confess that jesus is <laughs> jesus is lord meaning god jesus is god and so when you start reading the book of john with at, at least the prologue of john that is verse 1 to verse 18 there's so much harmony to to eat with the entire bible that it's surprising that people don't see the jehovah's witness and the mormons and all these and all these cults who are here to destroy the uh, the sovereignty and the and the deity of christ any single person that attacks the deity of my lord and savior jesus christ and any person that thinks that they are above the word of god and they can come here and twist and twist the scriptures to 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 best fit their narrative the same is a liar when demons saw jesus they didn't start to argue and give us a thesis on why he's not christ they say we know you you're the son of god so my point is jesus christ is god and that is what qualifies him to die for our sins what qual- what qualifies jesus to die for our sins is because he's sinless so nobody else so nobody can die for him because any righteous person any righteous person which there's none any righteous person can pay for the sins of the other person by their own righteousness right and so when jesus shows up he can die for our sins because his god his holy is perfect right and so he does not need to atone for his sins he just needs to atone for ours all right um so and in verse 4 which reads in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it there was a man sent from god whose name was john this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe hmm? that was the true light which giveth light to every man that cometh into the world now here is talking about what jesus is going to do in summary is that he came to give us life and the life that is giving us is coming from his light he says he was not that light that is john the baptist but was sent to bear witness of that light that is christ jesus that was the true light which giveth gives light to every man that cometh into the world so what he's trying to put here is that jesus christ his main mission was to be the light of men that is a summary so we've seen who he is christ jesus the son of god in verse 1 to 3 verse 4 to 9 is telling us what he's coming to do what his main mission what his main intention is that in him was life i mean how how is it that you are not god but in you is life in you is life so he's not talking about him being alive 
He's talking about something that is inside of him. So inside of him is something that is beyond, which is in him was life, as we're saying, that so he's not talking about his existence as life. So he's alive in himself, right? But in him is life. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is what he's coming to do specifically, to be the light of the world. Now, I'm going to uh, put this in connection to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And I'd like, I'd like Pastor Bobby to read it. Isaiah chapter 53, because I believe Isaiah 53 is also talking about the same, same thing. Start from 52 verse 13. And the reason why I'm saying that is because this is more like an introductory part of, of the Messiah, of who the Messiah is. So it is important for us to know that this Messiah that showed up was prophesied about long ago before, you know, before he came into the scene. And Isaiah is writing this almost 700 years before Christ shows up. Yeah. So that, that is an interesting part, is that God, in his infinite knowledge, because he's the beginning and the end, in other words, he sees time in, a, in an aspect that none of us sees, he saw it wise that he tells us everything about the Messiah before he shows up. Every single detail about the Messiah so that he can also put a rubber stamp on his servant and says, this is he. You cannot confuse him with another person. Amen? So if you're talking about the Messiah showing up, we need to go back. Yes. <laughs> the only way to go in front is to always go back. <laughs> it's always to go back. So, perhaps, please. Yes. Okay, it says, Behold, my servant shall live prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Hallelujah. As many were astonished at thee, mm. his visage was so marred yes. more than any man, mm. and his form more than the sons of men. Mm. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Yes. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which have not been told to them shall they see, and that which they have not heard shall they consider. Yes, you, you can pause a little bit there. It starts by saying, Behold, this word behold, by the way, in relation to the Messiah, is actually in, four, in the books of the prophets, that is not in the New Testament, is in four different places. And all those four different places, Jimmy, in the book of Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8, somebody can open it. Uh, in the book of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9, somebody can get there. 9, 9, and you get to 9, 9. Uh, Pato go to 3 8, Pups go to 6 12. Uh, yes, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. <clears throat> yes, uh, Zechariah 3 8. And Zechariah 3 8, it says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows and the seed before thee, for they are men wounded at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So it says, Behold, I will bring, I will bring forth. My servant, the branch, the branch. My servant, the branch. 612. 612. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. The branch. And he shall grow out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. So, behold, in 612, is talking about the man. Mm -hmm. Behold, the man. Mm -hmm. uh, in 38, he says, Behold, uh, bring forth my servant, the branch. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Because I would get there. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 49. Mm -hmm. you, you who tell good news to Zion, go up on the high mountain. You who tell good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with strength. Lift up. Do not be afraid. Say to, this, to the cities of Judah, look, your God. Behold. The word there is behold, behold your God. So every single place in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets that is talking about the Messiah, when it says behold, it says behold the man mm -hmm. and behold my servant mm -hmm. and behold your God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
And that makes a very good case for us when you start reading the book of John chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 1 when he says that he was with God and he was he was God. Amen. And the reason why that is important is because anybody who is not holy, anybody who is not righteous cannot die for sinners. And that attribute can only be found in God. There's none, there's none good, no, not one. Amen. There's none, not angels, not men, not women, because there are only two, two categories, men and women. Mm-hmm. In men and women, the rest is confusing. The rest is confusing. <laughs> in men or in women. We in the right Bible. <laughs> <laughs> So it is important for us to know that when God is talking about his servant, in this case, by the way, the word there, the Hebrew word there is a slave. A slave. In other words, he has nothing else except that which comes from his master. When he talks about his servant or his slave, he talks about him in different aspects, in all the prophets. Behold, my servant. Behold, you are God. Amen. Behold, my branch. Let's talk about the branch of David. When you start to talk about the book of Isaiah chapter 53, uh, my Bible says the sin bearer, the sin bearing servant, the sin bearing slave. So our Savior and our Lord, what he did was he became a servant. He became a slave. He left his glory in heaven. The place where he was with the father before, just like it says that the beginning was the word and the word was with God was with God. In other words, there was fellowship between him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. He left that. He left his glory and he came down here to become a servant. And not just a servant to God, even a servant to us. And that is why when he comes to his disciples just before he goes to the cross, he washes their feet. He serves them. Amen? He washes their feet and tells them, now, how what I've done to you, now do to one another. <clears throat> Just like I was a servant to my father and I was a servant to you guys. Because it's not like these were bodyguards to Jesus, by the way. <laughs> In fact, if you want to take that analogy, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. Jesus was the bodyguard to them. Yes. That's why Peter says, where will you go and with you is. So he's trying to say, our source of life or our source of free freedom or our source of security is in you. Because the moment somebody says, okay, do you want to live? And then says, where will I go but with you? Anything else that comes after that is what makes, makes it a priority for them to stay there. And what comes out of his mouth is, and with you are the words of life. So this, the disciples go to the point where they, they, they go to understand that in Christ Jesus was life. Not only life in a, uh, in an arbitrary way, uh, to corner life, no, but eternal life. In the same same thing that John says that in him was life. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. So when the disciples was, was walking with Jesus, they saw a great light. Yeah. And that's why they're saying, where do we go? With you is life. With you, we've seen light. We've walked in you to the point where we've seen a great light. Our confidence is not in ourselves no more, but in the life that is in you. Right? Amen? Amen. And so, uh, Isaiah chapter 50, 53, uh, as perhaps as, as, as read, when he says, behold, in this place, he talks about now his servant. My servant shall deal prudently. Prudently there is, means wise. In other words, when he shows up, he will deal wisely. He's not a fool. He's not gazing. He has his own path cut out for him. He knows the work he's coming to do, and he takes it very seriously. Amen? And so what happens with that whole idea is this. Sometimes we usually think that what happened to Jesus was an accident. And some people, but they pre, uh, preach that, that he came, he was defeated, he was crucified, and God then rose him, you know, from the dead. No, he says he will deal prudently. 
He will. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall deal prudently. In other words, he is a wise servant. He knows what his master wants and is going to do exactly that. This, the salvation of our souls was a clearly planned was premeditated. A, was a premeditated. <laughs> it was thank you. Yes, it was premeditated. That is what the Bible said that he was slain before the foundations of. So before, 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 uh, in the beginning was the word. Before in the beginning was the word. I don't know if you're following here. Before, in quotes, in the beginning was the word. Before that, the plan was hatched. <laughs> yes, exactly. Before, before in the in the beginning, <laughs> before in the in the beginning, the plan was hatched. It was before the before the intro. Unona, these these movies and these are my titles. Ah, nini dunako kwa na mobs na Nigeria movies. We are going seven minutes of titles. You know, names and who is who. You know, before you see a picture. <laughs> so that was the planning. The planning happened before the film started. Before the in the beginning. And the reason why that happened there is because there were only three persons at that point. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they were one in unity. It was a plan that was had between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? And it was the desire of the Father that was manifested by the Son and has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so, when he says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall exalt and extol and be very high he shall he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high just as many were astonished at you so the language changes there so it's like god is speaking in first person right he's saying my servant uh, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high so he's talking about he's talking about the coronation of christ jesus the exaltation of 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 christ jesus so probably this is talking about after he has after he has been um after he has been crucified now he's been exalted amen but then the language changes a little bit up over chin and then it says just as many were astonished at you amen at you now the servant so his visage was mad more than any man so he's talking about the coronation he's talking about victory he's talking about exaltation of Christ Jesus but then it comes back it comes back a little bit you know and says just as many were astonished at you so his visage was mad more than any man now he starts to describe an event that that messed up with his visage by visage here we mean the physical body the physical body because i don't believe it has anything to do with him just being uh with him just being normal biologically the way he was born because if god was born then he must have been the most handsome person in the whole universe <laughs> he must have been the most handsome person you just want to behold mm-hmm. that's why even people were so drawn to him right mm-hmm. some were not just drawn because of what he was saying i mean it's clearly <laughs> right because if all of them were drawn by what he was saying then they could have been all saved mm-hmm. right yeah. but some of them were drawn by the miracles by how he spoke the food <laughs> the food also yes <laughs> exactly some of them were just with drawn with how he spoke yeah. you know because you say that in this man not knowing you know not 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 know not knowing uh um uh he had not gone to school he had not gone to uh the temple to be taught yeah. but he knew so much yeah. you know So some of them was exactly in fact he went there to teach them and <laughs> at a very young age he's teaching people that were, were instructed in the you know uh, in the law and people were astonished mm-hmm. they were like where did this guy learn you know so people came to Jesus because of di- different things right but when we talk about his visage here his visage was mad so this is an action that was done to his visage he was not born like that something might have happened in between there and that is why by the way uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah is considered uh <laughs> to the uh, to the rabbis it's called a torture chamber to the rabbis because they just can't explain it oh. in fact in so many synagogues they don't read the chapter 53 actually some Jews don't even believe 53 is talking about it's talking about Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, they still dispute it. exactly wow. 
and then to justify it they say mm-hmm. it's talking about Israel mm-hmm. it's talking about Israel yeah. as a as a people as a nation yeah. as a nation the only problem is as we are going to read the only problem is Israel is not a righteous servant Israel did not give themselves uh, voluntarily mm-hmm. to suffer Israel has never been faithful <laughs> to God. Yeah, I've never been <laughs> they've, ne- they've, never, they've never dealt prudently. <laughs> yeah. They've never at no point in history has Israel ever dealt prudently. Yeah. And that is why when God is making the covenant with Abraham, he's not he's not asking Abraham to sign also in the dotted lines. Abraham was just there to be there and then God made the covenant with himself oh. and accounted it to him. Accounted it to him by faith. That's why the Bible says, by faith, Abraham was just, by faith, was justified, by faith. Yes, he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So even the covenant between God and Israel, that is between God and Abraham and his seed, was not because Abraham was faithful to God, but because he knew, now this guy just messed up. So let's, uh, because I've chosen you with, with my own, you know, with my own prudence, I've chosen you. I'm going to make a covenant with you, but with myself. Mm. So when God comes to pass, uh, when the time comes for them to pass between the sacrifice so that the covenant can be sealed, Abraham was asleep. The dude yeah. at the corner, yeah. <laughs> he was dreaming of angels, yeah. maybe. <laughs> He's napping there, man. Yeah. What he's talking about at this point is, <laughs> I don't talk about at this point is, there was something that was done to his visage that had mud it. And he says, mud more than any man. This is one of those chapters to me, on a personal level, it usually does violence to my... It usually does violence to my spirit. Mm. I never read Isaiah and I'm like, hmm, the next chapter or the next verse. Because, and I realize why, by the way, how Isaiah chapter 53 is written, which in relation to jo- to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the prologue of John, is that it's talking about what Israel is going to testify about their Messiah later on in the future. So Isaiah is not just prophesying about the Messiah. It's more like he's giving an, an account of what Israel is going to realize later on. Of what they did to their Messiah. So when he says, and his form more than the sons of men. So the form of Christ, our Savior and our Lord, was beaten to the point, was beaten to the point that it was... It was mad more than the sons of men. There's nobody, there's nobody in history that has ever been beaten or has ever seen the, the kind of violence to the extent that Christ had it. And do you know why that is so, by the way? That is because he was experiencing the penalty of sin. He was experiencing the wrath of God. Yep. So it was not just it was not just something that was happening mm-hmm. disconnected to God or disconnected to the payment of our sins mm-hmm. and it was coincidental. Mm-hmm. It was not that he did it and then now God thought uh, because of that I can forgive people. No, he was actually experiencing the wrath of God. Mm-hmm. The full extent. But now it was not just the wrath of God, the wrath of God for all men. Yeah. <clears throat> and the only person who could who could take the wrath of God and handle it is God, God himself. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So he satisfied the wrath of God in God. In God. Yes. Hallelujah. That's the only way to do it. That is the only way yeah. to do Otherwise, it. Otherwise nobody can bear it. Amen. Amen.